From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson here. All right, Mr. Wilson, I'm braced. Rub it in. Well, you were a little overconfident. Overconfident? Let's face it, I made a jerk of myself. After I apologize to you, I've got to crawl out there and apologize to Mrs. Markey. I wouldn't be too hasty about it. I've been putting it off for the last two hours. After the way I talked to her, I'd rather walk into a cage of lions and face her again. But I thought her husband was alive, and I thought she knew it. Then your boys have to go and pull his body out of the surf. Uh, well, that's why I called. I had a tag for an out-and-out insurance fraud. Mr. Dollar, the way it looks right now, I don't know what it is. It was probably murder. What else? Look, if you want to lose your mind, you come on over here to the mark. Why? What do you mean? Mr. Dollar, I've been a detective for 20 years, but I've never hit one before that was as crazy as this. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Miami Beach, to the Home Office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Phantom Five matter. It happened to involve a 75,000 insurance policy. <laughs> Item 17, a dollar and 60 cents, taxi from my hotel to the county morgue. I couldn't figure what Wilson meant. When the cruiser Phantom Five burned and sank and William Markey's body wasn't found, I thought I'd spotted an attempted insurance swindle. I'd even warned Mrs. Markey not to try to file a claim. And then, a few hours ago, Markey's drowned body had been washed up on the beach. Wilson should be happy. He'd been proven right. But instead, he'd sounded more mixed up and uncertain than he'd been before. Come on in, Mr. Dollar. You know, you don't pick the pleasantest places in the world to hold conferences. I thought you might want to take a look at him. Though I'll be eternally blasted if I know what anybody could tell by looking. Well, there's the lad who's given us all the trouble, Mr. Dollar. William Markey, number 423. I never thought I'd see him here. I told Mrs. Markey that the only thing that would convince me he wasn't alive would be to see his body. All right, I'm convinced. And I'll never try to outguess an ocean current again. Everything seemed to add up to... Oh, now, wait a minute. Uh, I wondered how long it'd be before you noticed. Doesn't make sense. Like I said on the phone, this one is crazy. This was pulled out of the surf this morning? Right. And the cruiser sank five days ago. That's when Marky supposedly drowned. You're on the beam, Mr. Dollar. This body hasn't been in the ocean for five days. You win the four-day trip to Bermuda in a complete new wardrobe. Have you had an autopsy? Doc Morgan just finished it 20 minutes ago. That's why I called you. Doc wouldn't stick around himself. You know, I think he went out to get drunk. How long does he think Marky has been dead? Not over 18 hours since sometime last night. Looks like we were both right, for whatever good it is. He was alive after the sinking, just like you claimed, and now he's dead, just like I claimed. What was the cause of death? Drowning. Only you haven't heard the real crazy part yet. Why? What do you mean? You remember we found one of his shoes washed in a couple of days ago? Yeah. The body was wearing two shoes when they pulled it out. They always make one slip, don't they? Uh, a couple in this case. Huh? It's the second one that nearly pushed Doc Morgan off his rocket. What second one? Marky was drowned, all right but not an ocean. Huh? It was fresh water in his lungs, not seawater. Was Morgan sure? Swore by it, and then at it. That's what threw him. Yeah, I imagine. When you get an 18-hour test on a man who's supposed to have been dead for five days and find fresh water when it ought to be salt. Well, I guess the late Mr. Markey can't tell us much of anything else. So, where do we go from here, Mr. Dollar? Good question. You haven't found the car yet, huh? The one Marky bought under an assumed name? No, no, but I gave the boys an extra pride to bear down on it. 
Half the town force is out looking for it now. Wonder where he was hiding out for those four days. What I want to know is who killed him and how and why. Oh, the why is fairly easy. It's the who and how that carry the question marks. That fingerprint ID was certain, huh? There's not the slightest doubt of what this is, William Markey. Oh, you're looking for an easy way out, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I guess I am at that. Well, then it looks like our number one is the lad you've been after all along. Young Danny Haynes, huh? What do you say we go and have a talk with him? Only one thing was wrong with the idea. It didn't work. Haynes wasn't in, and the clerk at his hotel said he hadn't seen him all day. The night clerk admitted that he'd slept through most of his shift and wasn't sure of anything. We searched Haynes' room and found nothing. So for the moment, we left it at that. Wilson put a stake out in the hotel and went back to his office. I went to my hotel and waited. Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson. Yeah, what's up? We finally got a break. The boys found that car. Where? Parked at the curb out on the east side of town. It may have been abandoned there, or it may be where Marky was hiding out. It's in front of an apartment house. Have they checked through it yet? No, they haven't touched it. I'm leaving to go out there now. Want me to swing by and pick you up? If you don't, I'll sue you. I'll meet you out in front of the hotel. We stopped a block away and walked up to the apartment house. The car was still parked at the curb, and the plain clothes man watching it said no one had been near it. We went on inside and found the landlady, identified ourselves, and started questioning her. Luck seems to still be with us. Well, you see, most of my guests are permanent, as you might say. Or at least as permanent as renters ever are. Yes, we understand. In fact, the only unit I've let in the last two months is number 14. That's up one flight with a pull-down bed. When did you rent that one? Well, let's see now. I think it was um, about ten days ago. He paid a month's rent in advance. He? What was his name? Uh, Mr. Jones, Jones, a very nice, quiet, middle-aged fella. He lived by himself? Oh, yes, and never went out much. After he moved in, that is. He didn't stay here for the first four or five days after he rented it. Until the night the Fathom Five sank. When did you see Mr. Jones last? Well, it's a funny thing. He went out yesterday evening and he didn't come back at all. What kind of a car did he drive? Oh, good heavens, I don't know. But you can look for yourself. It's parked out there at the curb. A friend of his brought it by a while ago. What? What's the friend's name? Why, I didn't ask him. He's an awful nice young fella. He said Mr. Jones was going on a trip and sent him to pick up his belongings. And he had Mr. Jones's key, so I decided it was all right. He's up there packing now. Twelve. Thirteen. It's the next door down there. Better take it easy. It's hard to tell what to expect. Right. He's in there, all right. Try the knob. Easy. It's locked. And there isn't much choice. Who is it? Open up, Haynes. We want to talk to you. I said open up. Get away from that door. Watch it, Wilson. I'm warning you, don't try to come in. Well, we know now what to expect. I'll cover the door here, Dollar. You go down and tell Dave to cover the outside windows and call in for a couple of squad cars. Right. Hey, he's going out that window. There must be a fire escape. Come on, let's hit the door. <laughs> there he is at the bottom of the fire escape. Hold it, Haynes. Stay back. All right, Haynes, it's up to you. Throw down that gun or I'll drop you. I'm sorry, kid. He's down. Yeah. That second shot was dead center. I know. I tried to hold low on him, but it jumped up on me. Well, he said he'd die for her if it came to that. It came to that. It was after dark when Wilson and I drove out to the Markey Beach House. There were no lights on and nobody answered the doorbell. So Wilson forced entrance and we shook the place down. We found evidence of a struggle in the study and in the bathroom. Water from the bathtub had overflowed behind the tile and was still seeping out along the baseboard. We found a dressing gown of Mrs. Markey stuffed in the back of a closet, soaking wet. Piece by piece, Wilson collected his evidence, and the picture became more and more clear. He phoned in for a fingerprint crew and went on working. I left him there and went back into town to my hotel and took the elevator up to my room. Mr. Dollar. 
What are you doing here? Waiting for you. They've got extras out. They say the police shot Danny Haynes. I thought maybe you could tell me what it's all about. Sure. And what you mostly want to know is how much he talked before he died. Isn't that it, Mrs. Markey? I don't know what you mean. Then go on out to your house and ask Wilson. He's out there with a fingerprint crew. And I imagine he can tell you anything you want to know by now. I'd... I slipped up last night. I thought it was Haynes who came to your door. But it wasn't. It was your husband. And you told him to come back later. Then when I left, you called Haynes and had him come over. If he said that, he lied. I even gave you the idea for it myself. When I said the only thing that could convince me your husband wasn't alive would be to see his dead body. So you talked Haynes into helping you provide the evidence I said I'd have to have. My husband's body was found in the ocean. They told me that this evening. Yeah, but he didn't die there. He was drowned in the bathtub at your house, and you and Haynes did it. You're out of your mind. Danny Haynes was lying. Then go tell Wilson. It's his job now, not mine. Maybe you'll be able to convince him, but I doubt it. And I'm pretty sure you won't be able to convince a jury. You think not. I'll get the best lawyer money can buy. Yeah, you do that, Mrs. Markey. But don't plan on using any of that insurance money for it. Why not? Because there won't be any. That policy was already void when you and Haynes killed your husband last night. What? An attempted fraud cancels the policy the minute it's committed. In other words, Mrs. Markey, five days ago when your husband sank the Fathom Five and tried to play dead. I don't believe it. You've lost out all the way around, Mrs. Markey. Your husband, your boyfriend, your insurance claim. And now you stand a pretty good chance of losing your life. A four-time loser. That's really a record. Expense account item 18, $321.60. Hotel and incidentals in Miami and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $684.95. End of account, end of report. Remarks? You quoted a line of Shakespeare at the start of this case, Ralph. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Well, you're wrong. It turns out to be the widow who lies, and lies, and lies. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, beginning next Monday night. Next week. Well, if I'd minded my own business, I wouldn't have heard the girl beg for help. And from that point on, I needed help. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Barney Phillips, Carlton Young, Eleanor Audley, Sam Edwards, Shep Menken, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Roy Rowan speaking.